but we're really glad you're here. Thanks for joining today's CMDA monthly meeting for May 7th, 2024. Sting Pallet, president of CMDA. And we're so glad that you're all here today. We've got some wonderful speakers and a, a fun agenda. Today, board member Dr. David Shepard is going to host the meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and let you moderate, David. And I'm okay. Here. Yeah, everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So we usually start with uh, updates. So I don't, is Jenny Albertson or Chad Fear here with us? Chad's today? here for sure. Chad is here. Yes. Hi, Chad. Um, do you have any updates for us from CDPHE? Or... Good afternoon. Um, yeah, we just had our nursing home roundtable. We met with uh, representatives uh, across the Colorado community, um, you know, providers. And uh, and actually, I've Jenny and I uh, are, are still in the same room. Uh, we weren't able to get uh, to get moved on to our own offices, so we're we're going to sit here and, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, and Jenny and I did have a chance to talk. I think a lot of the things that uh, Jenny has a presentation for would be topics that um, that I would be bringing to share with you all as well. So I'm going to go ahead and defer to Jenny. Ah, excellent. Okay, I'll turn on my mic. And you want to mute yours and I'll see. You have any screen sharing you need to do? There we go. Yes, I do, if I could. All right. Yeah, we'll have to mute his computer and probably his microphone. There we go. Nope. He's figuring it out. How about now? Okay, check, check, check. Yes, no more feedback. All right. All right. I am going to go ahead and um, just share a, a few brief slides here. Um, and like Chad said, we're, we both wanted to talk about the staffing mandate. So I'm going to cover that first. Can you all see my, oh, not yet. There we go. Yeah, we can see. Okay. All right. So the staffing mandate, uh, we're expecting the federal register to update by May 10th to actually be the publication date. So in terms of when you set your clocks for your 90 days, your two years, your three years, five years, that's the date as far as we know. Eight years, and then you can like teach. And these are the key elements of the staffing mandate. I think I shared this with many of you in other settings, but just to give us a once over, there will be an RN required on site 24 seven. Uh, there will be an overall staff hours of 3.48 per patient per day, total direct care staffing, and then they'll break that down to 0.55 hours of RN, 2.45 hours of CNA, and then a remaining 0.48 that's discretionary within the direct care category. So there's an example there. If you had 100 residents, two to three RNs would be expected to be on staff at any given time, 10 to 11 nurse aides, and two additional um, nursing staff, and that could be CNAs, LPNs. And uh, the requirements are gonna come out in phases. So the first thing to roll out will be our facility assessment change. Uh, CMS is acknowledging that they aware, are aware that this is going to be very difficult for a lot of facilities. So this is their quote. They said uh, they acknowledge that some facilities will end up closing, but that the current situation with inadequate staffing had resulted in poor quality of care being rendered and a change was necessary. They said they cannot accept the status quo. So that's where they sit. And they are saying that they will be supportive with some sort of a national workforce initiative. It's under uh, drafting right now. So I don't anticipate that coming out anytime soon. But um, we also just heard from Joe Tanzi that CMS will be allowing us to allocate some of our CMP civil money penalty dollars towards scholarships to advance people into the RN role and probably to recruit some CNAs through um, their programs as well. So what I'm particularly concerned about with, with this is facility closures like we've talked about, but access in general is a concern across uh, the healthcare continuum. I wanted to just mention something that came out in the Kaiser um, Family Foundation news this last week um, about hospital boarding because we end up seeing this often where people are staying in the emergency room. And the reason why this is kind of new and different to talk about is that JAMA just released some new research findings about how older adults are particularly vulnerable to hospital boarding. And what I'm 
talking about with hospital boarding is someone comes into the ER and they can't be placed immediately into a post-acute setting. They can't be going to home health right away, or they can't be admitted. They end up sitting in the emergency room for a lot longer than they ought to awaiting appropriate placement or treatment. Um, and adults 65 and older account for nearly 20% of ER visits. So when we're talking about access, this is not a new issue that we're just seeing with mandatory staffing. Access is an ongoing concern. Um, often, for example, uh, skilled nursing facilities will have to hold on someone's admission because we have to go through a PASSAR process. You may, may be familiar with the PASSAR. to validate that we don't need uh, in, inpatient mental health treatment for an individual instead of placing them in a skilled nursing environment and so forth. There's a lot of red tape that our, our residents deal with in finding appropriate placement. Um, there's also uh, in the this research, there's uh, indication that people People who have been through a hospital boarding situation have longer stays in the hospital and they have increased opportunities for medical complications. So the good news on access to care is that we are looking for Medicaid presumptive eligibility to come out in the near future. And what this will change for us and for you as providers is that we should stop seeing denials for acceptance based upon Medicaid pending status. So this is particularly an issue in long-term care and skilled nursing because when you have someone Medicaid pending, you have to weigh that as an operator. Do I have too many Medicaid pending people? Because you don't actually receive any payment for them while they are in pending status. And it's typically 90 days can be greater that you're floating that person's care. And so it's a volume issue with Medicaid pending, but then we also see denials specific to hospice Medicaid pending because they have to establish residency over a 30 day period. And if someone is in danger of passing away in less than that 30 day period time, that's when we go to you to write a letter to Medicaid, to beseech them to still approve Medicaid. Um, but it is a very problematic circumstance and we can see denials for that. So I'm hoping presumptive eligibility eliminates both of these practices of denying for admission and we can actually get people the care that they need at the time when they need it. There's also some news coming out about a pilot through CMS and through an initiative through an outside uh, coalition that meant to address the NASM report. This is the Academies of Science report that made a lot of recommendations for changes to long-term care. And part of the changes that they were recommending was trying to help expedite the survey process, make it go more quickly. And the reason why they wanted to do this was because they were seeing a lot of facilities that have repeat good performance that don't really necessitate the full complement of surveyors, the full um, time that they allocate. And maybe we can free up our survey teams to be a little bit more efficient if they can say, you have kind of a deemed status of a good history. So we aren't going to plan to be there as long as necessary for a typical survey. And so they're piloting this in several states. Colorado is not a pilot state, unfortunately, um, but we will benefit from the findings. And um, as of April, uh, CMS is uh, working in testing the actual pilots right now over the next several months. So look for that to come out soon with some recommendations about maybe a different type of survey that CMS will be permitted to use at the state level. And part of why this matters, uh, and I, I promise I'm almost done, um, part of why this matters is Five Star is dominated by survey results. And if you don't have timely surveys and you have something that's old because survey teams are too bogged down with backlogs of surveys or they have too many complaints to go to so they can't actually update your five star rating, um, you can end up with a pretty distorted uh, quality reporting for the consumer to see on the Nursing Home Compare website because typically your star rating for survey is correlated directly to your overall star rating. That's very common, 60% of, of nursing homes, that's the case. So if we can abbreviate and make surveys not only easier to do, um, but more quickly updating the five-star system, you all are going to see a better picture for your consumers, your patients and families looking at those results. And then I just wanted to make sure you had access to our updated calendar coming forward. There is going to be our spring conference. We'd love to see you there coming up in Beaver Creek. Um, take advantage of the discounted hotel rates that you get. <laughs> it's a fraction of what it normally is to be up there. Um, but also I wanted to make sure you're aware of 
both the abuse prevention training that I jointly conduct with Chad and other um, state agencies coming up in June. And also it's probably um, of interest to you all to look at the decisions, competency and guardianship training that's coming up uh, because we often deal with issues of competency with um, concerns about how do we find a guardian for someone? Do we need a medical proxy? All of those ins and outs of legalities. I'm involving people that actually are in the know about all of this um, and can give us some, some clarity on legal ramifications and things we, we deal with an awful lot um, and you deal with an awful lot as providers. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, excellent. I think we had a, we still have some time. I think we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, there was a question in the chat. Is the presumptive eligibility for Medicaid unique to Colorado or is it a national initiative? That is actually state level. All Medicaid programs are jointly funded at a state and federal level. We get federal matching dollars for our, our state level programs through healthcare policy and financing, but any changes we make to Medicaid eligibility, county level processing, any of that is generally done at a state legislative level. And so this is state only. Okay. And then I had a, a quick question. So it looks like LPNs are still not included in that staffing. Ended. Correct. LPNs can be included in the 0.48 PPD, um, but we did not win that battle uh, as far as making them part of the requirement. So what I'm assuming we will probably see is a lot of people trying to get their LPNs to become RNs in the period of time that we have before this rolls out, which is two years um, for our urban and three years for our rural providers. Okay. Excellent. Um Oh, another question, can non-CHCA members join the competency? competency? Absolutely. We always have non-member rates as well. And um, yeah, absolutely. The registration is open for both. Just go on to our events calendar on cohca.org. Okay, excellent. Thank you, guys. We're a little ahead scheduled. That's not a bad thing. Let me um, see if I can share the correct screen here. Yeah, are you guys able to see that? You can see it, but it's not in slide mode if you want I'm to. I'm working on that. Okay. <laughs> Is it in slideshow mode for you? It was a second ago. Okay, I'll have to fix it here in a second. So um, so I, I'd like to introduce Asma Farouk. Um, she's going to be our speaker today. Dr. Farouk is a psychiatrist with Behavioral Health Solutions, and she earned her medical degree from the University College of Medicine and Dentistry in Pakistan. She wow. trained in general medicine in Pakistan as well, and then completed a residency in psychiatry at UNLV um, Medical School in Las Vegas, Nevada. And she's here to discuss the somewhat controversial topic of using pharmacogenetic testing for psychiatric medications. So I'd like to thank Dr. Farouk for volunteering her expertise and taking the time to review this topic for us. Um, and with that, Dr. Farouk, I will try to get it to slideshow mode if it goes. And I'll advance the slides for you if you want me to, and you just you just tell me when. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Shepard, really appreciate it. Yep. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic, uh, knowing that, you know, lately this topic has been pretty hot in the market. Um, so I wanted to talk about a psychiatrist's perspective on the genetic testing for psychiatric medications in the wake of APA task force uh, recommendations. Um, next, please. Can I do the next slide? So the learning ob objectives for this talk would be you know, just introduction, brief introduction about uh, pharmacogenomics. I'm pretty sure uh, pretty much all of you know about it. Um, so would not go into too, too detail and also because we have limited time. So I have to cover all this in 20 minutes. Um, and then I briefly want to talk about APA task re review, what were their findings so far? Um, and then the research, the meta-analysis so far that we have done, uh, just to see if all these claims from these big companies are true or not. Um, and then we did the commercial claims analysis. Um, and then we'll briefly talk about uh, evidence gap highlight. 
Um, and then at the end, uh, I want to touch base on, you know, the science of the art of psychopharmacology. Um, I know in, in medical school, we probably don't go through that and other schooling, but then during residency, psychiatry residency for four years, we do learn a lot about this art. So we'll briefly talk about that. Um, next, please. So brief introduction to pharmacogenomics. So uh, you all know pharmacogenomics is a study of how genes influence an individual's response to the drugs. This field is a subset of genomics that deals specifically with the interaction between therapeutics and genetic makeup of the individuals. Next, please. So we'll talk about briefly uh, APA task force review. I have also attached the link at the end under the reference, just in case if any one of you want to go into detail about it, uh, knowing that I'll be just briefly talking about the conclusion here. Um, so, uh, so there is this task force, APA usually assign this force to look into, you know, these certain things. Um, so an APA task force for novel biomarkers and treatments looked at the claims for four major commercial companies that are offering genetic testing to improve medication choices and reduce trial and error. Um, the task force concluded that there is not sufficient information to support the widespread use of pharmacogenetic testing in clinical practice. Next, please. So the uh, task force examined uh, four big companies. So there is GeneSight, you probably all know about this company. Uh, GeneSept is also pretty famous. And then lately we do have ID Genetics in town um, and they are, they're inviting a lot of providers to come and join their um, talks during a really nice dinner. Um, and then there is a CNS dose. So they examined that the evidence behind the claims that these pharmacogenetics tests are, can enhance the accuracy of drug prescription and reduce the trial and error often associated with treating psychiatric disorders. Um, so their findings, the highlighted findings are as below. So they look into the, their method. So there is a flaw in their method. So the research supporting the claims of these companies often had uh, methodological flaws that seriously undermines the claims. This includes issues like small sample size, short study duration, and lack of proper blinding in trials. So whenever you go to these talks, you can ask them about the evidence and they, they will share this very limited brief trial with you. The size, number size would be small. Uh, the duration is between six to eight weeks. Um, and then also it, it's not blinded, not double blinded. Um, these studies are exclusive, which means that there is lack of transparency. They are not willing to share this data to the public. Um, so that will be another thing. So we don't know what are the biases that would be getting in the way, like confounding factor, Dr. Hawthorne's effect. Um, so, so the algorithms used by these companies to derive treatment recommendations from uh, genetic tests, they're exclusive, or uh, in other words, they are uh, proprietary. Um, so this lack of transparency prevents independent verification of the claims and raises concerns about the scientific validity of the advice provided. Um, and then there is insufficient data overall. So ultimately the task force concluded that there's not enough robust evidence to, to support the widespread clinical use of these pharmacogenetic tests. They noted that the data does not convincingly support the commercial claims of improved treatment efficacy through these tests. Next, please. So the conclusion drawn by the APA task force, and you probably already know what APA is, it's not American Psychology Association, I forgot to mention, it's American Psychiatric Association. Um, task force that is that while the concept of using genetic testing to guide antidepressant prescription is promising, the current applications by these commercial entities do not yet meet the high standards required for widespread clinical use. They emphasize the need for more rigorous transparent and independently verifiable research to substantiate the claims made by pharmacogenetic testing companies. So I just want to be very clear here that, uh, again, this data, we don't have access to it. They're not transparent about it. Um, and we are not allowed to do our, run our own independent um, research, which will be more unbiased. 
Um, this cautious stance reflects a broader consensus in the psychiatric community that vial pharmacogenetics hold potential for the future of personalized medicine. Uh, it is not yet ready to be implemented widely without further validation and evidence of clinical utility. So there's a general consensus among the psychiatrists. We do not, at this time, we do not support uh, genetic testing for psychotropics. Next, please. So we'll also briefly talk about the research view. So this is a meta-analysis. It's done by a pretty, pretty famous physician. His name is Daniel Mueller, and uh, he does shows up at a lot of the APA conferences, annual conferences. He, he gives a lot of talks about genetics, um, and there is a link attached at the end. You can uh, look into the meta-analysis. It's very, very detailed. Um, I'm trying to keep it brief here, just because, again, there's time constraint. Um, so the, the genome-wide pharmacogenetic studies have been undertaken to systemically investigate gene by drug interactions. Among the largest are the, um, they're the GenDEP project. Uh, it's pretty famous. There's Mars project. That's also pretty famous. And then STAR-D itself is pretty famous among the psychiatrists. Um, so unfortunately, a meta-analysis of data from all three initiatives did not reveal reliable predictors of treatment outcomes. Several recent reviews address both the promise and the challenge of using pharmacogenetic data to improve precision in treating major depression. Um, few actionable drug gene interactions have been identified uh, with an exception of uh, HLA-B1502 allele, which strongly associates with uh, carbamazepine-induced Steven Johnson syndrome among Han Chinese. Um, so that's one thing that's very reliable, which, but it's only and only uh, relevant to uh, if, you, if you have the genetic makeup of a Han Chinese. Um, and in that case, I would rather avoid carbamazepine, which is also not a first line mood stabilizer uh, anyways. Uh, we do have other options that are first line like lithium and Depakote. So if I already know that your background is Asian, I would rather avoid uh, carbamazepine in that case. Um, next, please. Instead, it has been generally concluded that despite laudable efforts, no studies have left to actionable from epigenetic data that provides a more comprehensive framework for the selection of initial antidepressant medications or to guide subsequent steps in the treatment of major depression. Because most prescribers of antidepressants are not expert in pharmacogenomics or genomics, uh, the APA Task Force for Biomarkers and Novel Treatment conducted a detailed analysis of the literature to provide prescribers with a readily understandable summary of the field especially in view of efforts to market these tests to psychiatrists, primary care physicians, and the public. Um, and I would agree with that because a lot, a lot of us don't know a lot about genomics. We probably briefly you know, learn about it in med school uh, or other schools, and then we forget about it. So I briefly wanted to uh, talk about this uh, article as well. Um, on the marketing and the use of pharmacogenetic testing for psychiatric treatment. Um, so cl clinicians, they hope to see uh, translational uses of powerful new technologies like you know, uh, brain imaging, PET scans, and now we have this new gadget, new cool tool, which is genoming testing. And whenever we have something cool and new in market, we all get very excited about it, just like we all are very excited about AI nowadays. Um, so they looked into it and many newly risen companies promised to address this hope. Um, and they're very, very aggressive about the marketing. So uh, they basically so far looks like one of the company, uh, they have done sales of over uh, 650K PGEN tests. Um, and then does the evidence support such use? The heterogeneous and complex underlying causes and mechanism of illness and clinical response to the treatment in major depressive disorder strongly suggests uh, that there will be serious issues limiting or preventing the development of this approach. And I'll go in detail in my next slides why we think that there are other factors, but we'll briefly talk about it here. Um, so uh, simply a major depressive disorder, it's determined by large number of genes 
Um, and except in rare cases, no single gene or limited gene set, um, even for those drug metabolism and drug targets uh, determines more than a few percent of the risk of illness or course of treatment itself. So there are other factors where these genetic testing uh, does not talk about. So there are the environmental factors, age, sex, diet, alcohol use, hormonal status, and then your overall general health. Um, and then there are the co-medications that are usually more important factors than the uh, inherited uh, determinants of the drug metabolism and response. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we learned is that pretty much most of us are uh, neutral metabolizers or normal metabolizers. There are very few humans that they have started that are fast or slow metabolizers. Um, so, and then also, uh, but my understanding is that there are many, many, many genotypes out there that we don't even know and we have not studied. Um, so far, we have studied five genes and we have only studied those five genes for 28 drugs. And that is one aspect of it. We're also talking about a biopsychosocial approach. That's the main or the bigger picture in psychiatry world uh, versus just these five genes and how these five genes affects these very specific 28 drugs. Um, so two of the genes that we talk about is cytochrome, uh, under cytochrome P450, there's one is called cytochrome 2D6 and the other one is cytochrome 2C19. And then we already talked about HLA-B1502 allele, and that's, that's what we know so far. Um, but what my understanding is after doing the research, there are multiple, multiple, many, many genotypes out there that are absolutely unknown, and we don't know much about it. Um, next, please. And then I wanted to do briefly a commercial claim analysis. Um, so the, in the analysis of the commercial claim analysis um, made by all these big companies that are marketing pretty aggressively um, and they're marketing that they're basically, they have this genetic test that they're improving psychiatric medication selection, having us avoid uh, trial and error. Um, and then several critical co uh, considerations uh, that emerge from this are, uh, overstated efficacy, companies often promote these genetic tests with claims that they will significantly reduce the trial and error process of finding the right psychiatric medication. However, the scientific backing of such claims is frequently questions by, questioned by the experts. Um, so when I say experts, it's, they're mainly, of course, the people who do all the research in genetics, and then there's the APA. Uh, entity as well. The evidence provided is sometimes based on the studies with small sample sizes. We already talked about that. Short durations, very limited durations, uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks. And then uh, uh, there is flaw in their methods, um, which does not support the broad claims of improved clinical outcomes. Um, and then they're not transparent with us. A major concern is that uh, proprietary nature of the algorithms used to generate patient-specific recommendations, uh, the lack of transparency is in how these recommendations are derived, makes it difficult for the medical community to evaluate and validate the effectiveness and the reliability of these tests. This secrecy also complicates peer reviews and unbiased evaluation. So just know that we have not been able to do that. Um, so that is one of the barrier. Um, and then there is a regulatory scrutiny. Uh, although some tests have received clearance or approval from regulatory bodies like FDA, um, others have not. The regulatory landscape is uneven. It's not even, it's not uniform. Uh, this inconsistency can lead to confusion among the healthcare providers and the patient about the reliability and the validity of these tests. Oh, great. Next, please. And then there's the ethical and privacy concerns. The use of the genetic data raises significant ethical and privacy issues. There's a concern about how this sensitive information is stored, who has access to it, and how it might be used beyond the scope of medication selection. Patients and provider must be aware of these issues when they're deciding about these tests. And then uh, 
There's the cost and benefit issue as well. And how do we balance that out? So the cost of our microgenetic testing can be pretty high. Um, and it is not always covered by the insurance. This raises questions about the cost effectiveness of such tests, uh, particularly if the benefits are not very substantial. Um, then the better uh, traditional methods that we have, which is really the, um, the biopsychosocial approach that we use in psychiatry. Um, so for instance, I just learned about it that ID genetics test, they cost $330 out of pocket for commercial insurances, or if you're uninsured. Um, and then uh, looks like there's $0 out of pocket. And that's the main thing that they're marketing right now because they just got the approval for this. So there's a $0 out of pocket for Medicare Part B and then Medicare Advantage and then Medicaid. But then they would, there's also a disclaimer that would say it's subject to deductible amounts. Next, please. So I wanted to highlight the evidence gap we have here. So there is a notable gap between the theoretical potential, potential of these tests and the actual evidence. So there's a difference between potential and actual evidence that supports their routine clinical use. This discrepancy is significant. Uh, while the potential of genetic testing in psychiatry is substantial, bridging the gap between this potential and practical. Okay. I think that was an error. Okay. Uh, while the potential of genetic testing in psychiatry is substantial, bridging the gap between this potential and practical evidence-based clinical application requires more robust research, clear regulatory guidelines, and broader educational efforts within the medical community. Um, stakeholders must address these issues collaboratively to harness the full capabilities of pharmacogenetics in improving mental health outcomes. One thing that I wanted to mention that these tests do not provide us any guidelines in terms of the dosage. So if these tests are telling you that you are in green or you are in uh, yellow versus red, especially when it says you're in red, it does not tell you if you're a fast metabolizer, what's the dosage for eripiprazole then at that point. If you're a slow metabolizer, then what's the, what's the dose range? So it does not actually provide you any guideline about the dosage. So in a sense, for me as a psychiatrist, um, I would rather at that point rely on the blood level of clozapine because that will give me a better sense in terms of the dose range versus just a genetic test telling me if my patient is a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer. And then at that point, I don't know what to do with that information in terms of dosage. Um, and then I briefly wanted to talk about the science of the art of uh, psychopharmacotherapy. So we spent four years in residency talking about it. Um, although, you know, we, we all go through the training. We know, we know the pharmacology. We don't have to go over that during the residency for four years. But the main thing that the programs usually dwell on is really the science of the art of prescribing a medication. So the medication outcome are shaped by a range of psychosocial factors. Um, I really wanted to add the picture there that has red and blue color. Uh, there's a meaning to it. We'll talk about it in a second. So the, there's a prescriber's effect that is characteristic of the pill. And then there's known clinical patient characteristics. And then there is the therapeutic alliance. Next, please. So, so the pill characteristics shapes the outcome. So you probably all know about this, right? So the red pills are very energizing, but that's how they're perceived. The blue pills are very calming in most cases. And then the expensive pills, they work better, uh, the branded versus the generic one. And they have done a study on it and you can go and look into it. It's a very interesting study. Um, and then the implications of generic substitution, most patients report decreased intention to continue the medication if it's generic. Um, and then there is, 34% of the patient experience a new adverse event. Um, so that's also there. Next, please. And then we all know about the placebo and the antidepressant effects. Um, and you can look into that study as well. It's very interesting. Next, please. So the non-clinical patient characteristics, I would not go in super detail about it, but briefly just 
talk about it. So there is, of course, socioeconomic status that affects right the income, education level, occupation, overall access to the healthcare services, disparity within the healthcare system. Um, and then there's a cultural background, the culture believes and practices uh, that affects a lot. There's a lifestyle choices, how physically active you are, smoking, drinking, um, and nowadays marijuana. Um, that also affects, and then there's the psychosocial factors, there's a stress level, social support, your family dynamics, the relationship with family and peers. Um, and they, of course, affect overall person's health and well being. Um, and then the geographical location, if you're living in rural versus urban climate, do you live in uh, Michigan or Colorado or Florida? That affects a lot. Um, so these are the characteristics we do take account into uh, as a psychiatrist when we're prescribing a medication. So that's the art. Next, please. And then, of course, there are the variables, uh, you know, patient variables that can affect the medication outcome. So you can have this perfect genetic testing for these specific five genes for 28 drugs, but you, we still have to go over these variables, right? The medication is not going to work if you have these, right? If a patient is neurotic, defensive style, locus of control, autonomy, uh, sociotropy, social disadvantage. So if they have all these, you know, then that can also be a barrier. Um, and then you can look into it. I will not go in detail about it today. You'll all have access to all these slides, by the way. So pharmacotherapy alliance, very important, right? Alliance is different than compliance. Um, so it really like directly correlates with the treatment response. Uh, alliance is equally powerful factor in pharmacotherapy as in psychotherapy. Alliance is a stronger determinant of treatment outcome than the drug itself. So there's active drug versus placebo. And then the elements of an effective pharmacotherapeutic alliance, just wanted to give an example, um, not just a blanket statement. So there's the warmth and presence, the way you present uh, in person versus telehealth, an AI talking to you versus a human talking to you, uh, the autonomy support, right? Preserving their rights, giving them the autonomy, uh, agreement about the targets, respect for treatment preferences, um, and then shared decision-making. So it's patient-centered approach, patient is part of the decision-making, and then good communication. So just a brief summary, you know, we talked about the challenges and the limitations. We talked about insufficient evidence, lack of transparency, and then there's the regulatory and ethic, ethical concerns. And then it's about also about the price, the cost effectiveness, and then the research need. We talked about it that we do need further research. Currently, the research we have is not if it's not enough. Um, and the conclusion is that the consensus about psychiatrists that the psychogenetic testing is not yet ready for standard care stems from these challenges and limitations that we talked about. While the potential for personalized medicine in psychiatry is immense, current genetic testing must be subjected to rigorous scrutiny and validation. The field requires continued research, clearer regulatory guidelines, and greater transparency from commercial providers to ensure that when pharmacogenetic testing are used, they're both scientifically sound and clinically relevant. Next, please. So these are the references. You'll have access to it and you can look into it. Uh, especially, I, I would highly encourage you to look into the meta-analysis. It's really good and very, very detailed about all four companies. And then for questions and answers, if we don't have time, you can always email me at this address. My email address is my first name, Asma, A-S-M-A, dot my last name, F-R-O-O-Q, at vhs.help. Right, excellent. Thank you very much. We, we're doing great on time, I think, are we saying? So yeah. we, we do have some questions here in the chat box. I'll try to condense them and ask. Um, so behavioral health issues have significantly increased in prevalence, and we've noticed an increase in a push towards genetic testing for residents. If a facility does perform these, how do we go about interpreting the data, especially for over metabolizers? It seems the messaging is to use 
uh, use of higher than maximum recommended dosing on medications. Yeah, so that's the recommendation, but then at the same time, they don't give you a dose range. So as a provider, you would need to make the decision with your patient how you're going to go about this. And I think that's one of the barrier that we are running into. There is yeah, no so, line. So we have this information, we don't know quite how to interpret it. That's yeah. the point. And then there are other barriers looking into their liver function, their kidney function, uh, that also gets in the way. Okay, okay. Uh, from Steve, with most people being normal metabolizers, what are your thoughts on the risk of tramadol and risk to patient with over versus under metabolizer and the risk of side effects versus using low dose oxycodone? So although they're not psychiatric medications, I'm going to try to use this with an example of a psychiatric medication. Um, so what do I compare with? Benzos? Yeah, that's probably good. So the question is, what are the risk of tramadol and the risk to patient with over under metabolizer and the risk of side effects versus using lower dose oxycodone? Right, I think, you know, if someone's an over or an under metabolizer, would, would you just switch drugs and when you do that, there's a new risk benefit analysis you have to do, right? Yeah, I think I'll, I will go with the dosage. Uh, that's what I would do. I would, if they're fast metabolizer, I would try to slightly increase the dose and I will closely observe them, making sure they're not getting any side effects with increasing dose. Uh, if they are slow metabolizer, I will reduce their dose. And also, of course, that will be relevant with their symptoms. If it does correlate with the symptoms, I will stick with that dose. Okay. And then if patient is not responding, then I might think about changing the medication. Okay. Steve, if, if that doesn't answer your question, feel free to unmute and clarify. And um, there was a question about what approval they just got. So I guess one of the companies just got FDA approval for using this test clinically. Is, is that correct? So it's very, very specific. So they only approve for uh, only five genes we talked about um, for 28 drugs. So it's very specific to 2D6, uh, 2C19, and then HLA. Um, and that's, that's a general consensus. We know that you know for Abilify, there is 2D6, uh, 2C19 for a lot of the antidepressants. So, but it's very, very limited. Um, and there are other uh, genotypes that we have not studied, we have not looked into. So th this information has been around for a long time, actually. So th that has been approved a while ago. And uh, it's at the same time, it's very limited and it doesn't help. Okay. But overall, it's not approved just for those specific things. If patient is resistant, has tried everything, and then they can have this. Yeah, most of those reports certainly list a lot more cytochrome P450 um, enzymes than just those. Okay. Um, another question about, um, I can't think of a Medicare Part B charge where a copay is waived without the patient applying for financial hardship. Are they opting not to charge a copay? To opt not to charge is a violation of Medicare Part B rules. So I don't know if you know the specifics about how these get paid for. Not. I I don't know that. I just learned about it from ID Genetics. Okay. I went to their talk to learn about what are their what are they talking. So that's what I learned. I don't know the details. Okay. I'll look into it. Let's see what else we. Yeah. So Jay, Jay Tillman, as a psychiatrist as well, I can't agree enough with your excellent presentation. Um, Thank you. And Dr. Pallet, it seems that the longer people live the more psychosocial influences may impact their health. Um, would you take that into consideration before genomic testing as people age? So if if they are above 65? Yeah, yeah. I, I would still consider, I would still have the uh, biopsychosocial approach. 
even if it's geriatric population, um, they're above 65, I would still consider that. Like I said, pretty much most of us are uh, normal metabolizers. There are very few that are fast or slow metabolizer. Um, I will, after considering the biopsychosocial aspect uh, and then patient not responding to the medication, uh, there'll be the time I'll start looking into it or thinking about. But even for geriatric population, I would not use this as a screening tool. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, so that's all of the questions in the chat box. So I, I have a question for you. Do, do you currently use this for any particular drug? Is there any scenario where you reach for this technology? Yeah, so I would, so do, from my past experience, I would do it for, a, if the request is coming from the patient, if my patient is very left brain, very neurotic, he, he all, all he cares about is the evidence. So I can present all the options to him. I can provide him all the psychoeducation, but the only thing he wants is this new tool and he wants to get this done. And that's the only way he's going to believe. That will be the time because it will actually work for him as a placebo effect as well. So if, you, if there's a patient who, who's hardcore left brain, wants the evidence, then I'll do it. Okay, excellent. Are there any other questions? We have some time. I'm just curious actually what your approach is to uh, when a facility has uh, kind of been flipped by a, a, a rep and the entire the entire place has already been tested and you have a patient, this happens so frequently, a patient is on a medication in, in the red column and they not having any side effects and they seem like they're um, doing quite well with the medication. And, you know, it opens up liability issues, treatment issues, and, you know, that's a concern kind of makes it a problem when there's some sort of adverse event. Let's say the patient falls and then, you know, if, if there's a litigious family, they can look at the genetic testing and say, well, you know, doctor, you know, you were prescribing a patient, this medication that's in red and it's a problem. Did you know that? And that, that's been a concern that's been raised. And I did con uh, was concerned about it too. Just wonder what your uh, thoughts are about that. So in terms of the liability, what my understanding is that it's, it does provide us, genetic testing provides us more like a general guideline. It's a supplement, but it's not standard of care. So that itself should eliminate the liability aspect. In terms of having a fall, do we really know the fall happened from the medication because it was in red? I highly doubt. Um, right. So if even if it's red and patient is responding and that's, let's just say it's placebo effect, I will continue the medication and I will justify that in my documentation why I'm still continuing it. And that's one of the reasoning that getting this testing done, it's, it still does not changes my practice. It doesn't change the outcome, especially if patient is responding. Uh, I think that's where the issue is. If we start using this testing as screening tool, that's where the issue comes in. In a sense, then we are opening the Pandora box. I completely agree. Thank you for this presentation. Yeah, and just to yeah. piggyback on that, I, I have had companies say that we should be testing everybody for this before we ever start them on anything. And so I've had facilities, you know, request that we start doing that. And um, if that happens, my approach would be to say to the facility, that's a great idea. You have to be aware that Medicare won't pay for screening. Therefore, the facility will have to pay. Yeah, that usually, that probably stopped the buck right there. <laughs> I have a question about like the magnitude of these correlations. You said in that one study where they found at least one gene that was actionable for Han Chinese people on carbamazepine. Do you know like what, how strong that correlation was or was it like everyone who has that marker responded the same way? So if I don't have the exact range, but we, so this information has been there forever for the HLA uh, um, 1502 allele. Uh, so, so far they would say that it's associated with um, Stephen Johnson reaction for uh, Han Chinese, um, but I, I don't have the exact range. What's the predictability if you are Han Chinese? Um, but this information has been out there forever before the genetic testing. So that's like a very like bare minimum. We all know about it, um, but I'll look into it. 
what's the probability of having that if you're Han Chinese? Okay, excellent. Do we have any other questions? I think we're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, anything else that we should cover here, Dr. Powell? No. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining and bringing some thoughtful questions for Dr. Farouk. Um, we're just coming, recovering from our CMDA annual conference, which was on April 19th. And it was really great to see many of you there. So we appreciate the support. And the, in case you didn't join it, the last journal club last week, the Geriatric Journal Club, um, started off with this wonderful review of takeaways from the CMDA conference. So be sure to check that out. Yep. Our next CMDA meeting will be on Tuesday, June 4th. And that will actually be a business meeting where we talk about CMDA and where we're at. So look forward to seeing you there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think that'll conclude the meeting. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.